Hello, my name's Grace and um, this is my knitting podcast, well, knitting and travelling and collecting nice things from, nice yarny things from countries all around the world, hopefully, that's my plan. Um, so this is my episode three, three, um, of my knitting podcast and I want to say thank you so much to um, three people who I know who've mentioned me. Um, Mina, she gave me this amazing shout out and she like gave this random history of how we actually know each other, which is so complicated that it's almost impossible to explain to, although Mina did a very good job. Good job, Mina. Good job. It's basically a friend of a friend. No, a friend. No. Yes. Yeah, she's a friend of a friend who I met in Limerick when she came visiting and she met my friend in Canada and it's all very complicated but she gave me the sweetest ever shout out and oh Mina you're the best you're the best you're the best um oh, you just you just inspired me to make all the things I want to make everything all the things but it that's the, what's so nice about these knitting podcasts is like not everything is to my taste not everything is to everybody else's taste but you can like be like oh god they've done that maybe I could do something like that you know it's so inspiring that you could maybe you like different colors or different patterns or you want to like different things that fit your shape and that's what's so great about knitting I didn't make a podcast last week um because I was down in Denmark uh not Denmark Europe uh Denmark Australia which is a tiny, tiny town <laughs> in so, um, the south of Western Australia. And um, it was really nice. It was really, really good. Uh, but I didn't get a chance to make a podcast down there because I was with a couple of people. I can't believe that I've got subscribers. Like, even one subscriber. Like, I'm so happy and delighted <laughs> that people want to see what I'm doing with myself. It's just so lovely. So I want to say thank you to all, every single one. I think there's 147, which seems like, you know, everyone's like, 5,000 subscribers. I'm like, 147. Oh my God. Every one of you I love so much. And I think like my first two videos have had like, I think the first one's had 350 views and the second one's had 200, 200. Like, I don't know if that's people going back. I think most of it's me probably just checking. I'm like, and it starts playing and that counts as a view. So I'm like, <laughs> so it's probably only like seven people. <laughs> no, it has to be at least a hundred. Because, unless you like, saw me and subscribed because you're awesome. But it means that, it meant that I got the message saying, oh, you can have your own URL now that you have over a hundred subscribers. And I was like, fancy and it's so exciting so <laughs> thank you so much to all of you that's just wonderful okay on to the main core of the podcast which is about my travels and I'm going to go chronologically through my travels last week I did um Singapore Malaysia and Thailand and now this week I'm going to concentrate on Laos and Vietnam. Now, I'm going to be talking about all the nitty things I collected and knit along the way. And some of these things have been knit after I left Vietnam. That counts. Counts. Okay? Because I'm, I'm like dying to show you what I'm knitting right now. But then... I see I knit so slowly that it would take like seven weeks to finish one object so I'm quite enjoying being able to show you a couple of things at once. When it catches up with me I'll have to... I'm trying, I'm trying to learn how you do it Mina, I'm trying to keep my emotions small but I think I'm just expressive and I'm like... I'm trying to do the flick, you know where you, where you knit and, and you flick it like, like Mina does uh, but I'm like, I'm still going... <laughs> it's like slow motion, wee! Like, orbiting the moon to get a slingshot. Anyway, right, let's get started. So I entered Lao on a, at a time, oh, let me get my passport and I'll be able to show you all my stamps. It's not far, it's not far. Oh, I'll show you that bag later, another time. Passport, Irish passport, yay! 
I'm Irish, yes, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, Irish people generally tend to be nomads. That's why everyone has an Irish relative. So I entered um, Laos on the 23rd of January and I entered it over the friendship bridge between um, um, Thailand and Laos. And on the other side is uh, Huai Zai, which is normally where you start to take, to where you get the slow boat down the Mekong to Luang Prabang. And um, normally what they used to do is actually just get a boat, just a ferry crossing, but they've actually opened this bridge since. And it can it's actually a little bit annoying because you've got to get off the bus, get a tuk-tuk to the friendship, to like the, the border crossing. And then you've got to, um, you know, get across, you know, do the visa thing, get a bus to the other side, and then get another tuk-tuk into town. So it can be like, Silly expensive if you don't have a car. Well, it's not very expensive. I mean, the whole thing, including the visa, probably cost about fifty, sixty dollars American dollars, just across. But that's not too bad, I suppose, for a visa and everything. Um, so, uh, but it couldn't be that simple for Grace because she she doesn't have a brain very very often. And I've been traveling for like a month and a bit now, and you'd think I'd know that, um, you know, when you get off a bus, you pick your bag up from the from the storage bit that they. This is why I tend to keep everything with me, and because I'm I just forget my head. I'm just ridiculous. So, didn't I? Because I already had I had like two hand luggage things. I had a handbag, and like a dry bag or a wet bag, and I was like, that seems like enough in my head. <laughs> no, nope. oh, not enough. Not enough, Grace. Your bag's still on the bus. So I was panicking. I was like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And um, there was an American guy with me at the time. I tend to like pick up these. Everyone, when you're traveling on your own, you just tend to tend to pick up other people on their own. And he was like running around. He was like, oh my god, oh my god, where's your bag? Where's your bag? I was like, I don't know. Where did they blow it up? Oh, it's got all of my documentation in it. Well, you know, for Australia, I I could. It was all photocopied and. Nothing actually important was in there. <sighs> but it was like, oh god, all my stuff. Um, turns out that a beautiful soul had taken the last bag off of the bus and put it by the office. And I, I went over and I nearly cried. I was like, oh, oh my god. Anyway, that was really emotional. That was totally emotional. <laughs> So it's great. So we got into Hawaii's eye anyway, after all that panic. Oh, do you know when, when something like that happens, then you're like, oh, everything is wonderful. Life is good again. It's fantastic. It was one of those days. It was a brilliant, just a brilliant day. So next day, I uh, went in to um, go on the Given Experience. And the Given Experience is an amazing kind of conservation project run by, I think it's a French guy who um, set up uh, basically a tourism a tourism conservation company who basically use zip line through the forest so they're not cutting down trees you know they're just planting zip lines and you 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 don't touch the forest floor apart from when you're walking from one zip line to another so you're reducing your footprint a lot and you stay in the tallest tree houses in the world and they're just amazing um, so I was so unfit by that stage, so, so unfit, sorry, I'm really thirsty. Um, so I was, we were hiking for like an hour, but it was lovely, we stopped every time, and, but there was, um, there were bit, like, there were bins, like baskets every time, but people seemed to keep missing the baskets, throwing stuff on the ground, you know, like, beer cans and, racks my head, they should just forbid any rubbish or any plastic into that forest. It should just be forbidden, I think, personally. It's because it's a rainforest and it's a conservation project. Anyway, apparently they get rid of the bin rubbish by just burning it because they think that that disappears, that it just disappears. <sighs> anyway, that's my own plastic free soul dying inside me. So it was beautiful, but that night um, we stayed in the, um, I did the zipline express, the express was only two days, 
and it was a cold snap settled in over Southeast Asia and the cold snap I think it killed 63 people in Taiwan because it was just so unexpected and people in Southeast Asia are not used to the cold it's something to do with uh, global warming definitely but it was a freezing like I actually, I, I was with, uh, I think it was five Dutch guys, and five Dutch people, because it was a couple of girls and everything, and five French people, and me, and another English guy. Um, this is another case where it was like a mat, like a double mat, and you had this massive um, tent around you, so it was all open air, it was pretty much open air, there was no glass on the walls or anything in the treehouse, um, but it was like a mosquito net. And we, it was so cold. We had one each, but it was so cold. We all piled like, There was three to a tent. There was three to a tent thing just to keep the body heat up. It was so freezing. But the food was all made in the next treehouse over, where um, the uh, Laotian girls were like cooking away, and it was gorgeous. And it, most of it was vegetarian actually, which was beautiful. It was really lovely. And um, they brought over these giant tiffins, and it was fab. But you couldn't have any food out, otherwise apparently the rats would come and eat into your bag. So you had to put it in this bunker. And some people who I met later on had had like fruit pastilles, like lozenges that they'd forgotten about in their bag. And they'd eaten through the bag to get at them. Now, the night that we were there, it was too cold for rats. So I don't know which I prefer, the freezing cold or rats. Probably the cold. But even the forest, it's their forest. Deal with it. Um, we played this really good game actually in the middle of the night just to try and keep warm. It was called Werewolf, and um, basically you put down your there's if it works really well with a big crowd. So there's like you've got to guess who is the werewolf amongst you. It's brilliant. It was really really good. And the next morning we came down and um, it was still so cold, and we were like, please can we have some tea? Like <laughs> desperately, but there's no fire allowed in the treehouse. You can have the fire outside in the land. So we were freezing our little bombs off and um, like you couldn't even stand on the ground and like people were standing on stools just because the ground was so cold and I got I was I, I'd started knitting my uh, my socks actually my blueberry waffle socks oh I'll show you then these are my blueberry waffle socks so I just started the little the start of it when I was coming into Lao. And um, it was nice to have something warm on my hands, around my hands. <sighs> so knitting saved my life in Lao, <laughs> in a treehouse. <laughs> so it was coming back, I was coming back to, um... oh yeah, the zip lining was incredible. Oh my God, you would not want to be scared of heights. Like you had to like just run, jump and you had to like use your body weight and I think it was something to do with the heavier people actually went faster but then someone was like no 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 because if you're lighter you you're more streamlined and I was like I don't think so because it was all to do with like the speed that you'd take off and then your weight carried you along all the way I did manage to smash into a couple of trees though I was going too fast <laughs> you know go big or go home you know <laughs> but it was, it was amazing. I would recommend everybody to do it as long as you're not afraid of heights or rats or possibly the cold. But mostly it's never cold, so that cold is not supposed to happen. So the given experience um, from Huaizai. Oh, on the way back, right? Apart, we passed through these um, banana plantations and they were all organic banana plantations, right? Now, you know when you think organic, that's really good. Brilliant. Turns out that... Because they can't spray the bananas, they wrap them twice in plastic to keep the bugs off them while they grow. And also it keeps them green so it keeps them from ripening too much so they can ship them abroad. But the plastic just kind of, just, just like, basically there's like layers of five or six plastic bags underneath all of the trees and it's just left there and then it gets blown into the water courses. Get, it's really, really like really bad like so it seems like you can't do anything right you know for the environment if you're growing anything commercially I don't know that really upset me but that's just because I'm interested in that sort of thing so anyway um so I got back into Huaizai 
and it was still freezing and I had no clothes so no 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 warm clothes so I wandered along and I was like desperately trying to find clothes to fit a taller person taller wider person than the Laotian people and they um I found this shop and I found like a Liverpool t-shirt or no a Liverpool like hoodie and but I, basically I got it because it was like the warmest and it didn't have too many like crazy things on the front it was so warm on the inside and I bought like a pair of leggings, which I basically wore solid for the next three weeks. They were, I had to throw them out by the end. It was just awful. But, um, <laughs> it was funny. And then I was like, I, there's no way I'm getting on a boat to go down the Mekong for two days. Like, it is pissing rain and it is freezing cold. It was like two, three degrees, like Celsius. So, so cold, really cold. Um, I know, I know that some people are like, I'm in minus 50 and it's not cold, that's not zero, it's like a warm spring day, you're like, not when you're in Lao, <laughs> when, you're, when it's got a rainforest in it, you know, <laughs> and, and there's no heating anywhere, uh, everyone is in like wooden huts, and the only heating they have is lighting a fire outside, so they have to stand outside their own home to get warm, and they're all, basically everyone lined up around these like fire pits, and it, it was absolutely... So I decided to get a bus. I decided to get a 12-hour bus down to um, Luang Prabang, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site for how beautiful a city it is. The bus was a sleeper bus, so, you know, you're able to lie down, which was really nice, um, if you're small, if you're below five foot. It was fine for me. I was grand. I just... I knitted, and then I started um, working on... Um, I wanted to try and make a sort of a garment out of the um, the wool that or the crochet kind of acry acrylic thing that I got in um, in Chiang where is it Chiang Rai Chiang Rai Chiang Rai this is the company Sahasin and um, but that didn't work out because I was tired and we were bumping along so I just stayed on my socks, stayed on my blueberry socks so I was working on those and I probably got to about here by the time, because I do them two at a time now <laughs> these are my first heel flap and gusset socks and I did them two at a time <laughs> it's a tiny bit of a disaster but it totally worked, it worked, definitely it was fine um, I, you just have to, I just had to concentrate and I had like more stitches on, on the front stitch and then the back stitch and the opposite on the other sock and it was really bad, a disaster, disaster. Um, but yeah, so Luang Prabang is a um, French, it was like a French, Lao was owned by the French for a long, long time and Luang Prabang is famous for its French baguettes, the hill, its saunas and its amazing bars. Like in the middle of like it's like you'd find these incredible bars in Paris or somewhere. It's beautiful. The food was amazing. The people were so lovely. They had this bar. It was called Utopia. Oh my gosh! If you ever go to Luang Prabang, find Utopia. It's it's basically like a gigantic teepee uh, with like mats on the ground, and it leads on to the river and. Oh, it's just stunning. They all the bars only open until twelve in now, which is probably a good idea. But we, I found we found this little dog that was just curled up in amongst all of these drunk foreigners, and he was just like, "Hello, I'm just really warm and cozy." So we were riding him. I was a couple of tree sheets to the wind at that stage now. So, but it was so lovely. It was really, really beautiful. Oh yes, in Luang Prabang there was this amazing night market, and I got my first ever project bag. So cute. I'm going to leave this in or take it out. Leave it in because it looks full and busy even though I've not touched this project since then. So this is, ti it's only tiny, it's only small because you, know, like you can fit like a whole skein in there and everything you need so it's fine. It's fine. But it's, I, this is what I was knitting my blueberry waffle socks in. There's a photo on Facebook, and it just, I like that photo, uh, photo on Instagram, and I just like it. It's got little elephants in it, and there was, like, 
hundreds of them all laid out and they're, I don't know where they're made, it cost a dollar. Amazing. So my first project bag. I was so happy about that. So there was also this incredible waterfall that I managed to throw myself into in uh, just outside Doang Prabang. It was absolutely incredible. It was all um, calcite and the colours were beautiful. Um, yeah, um, then we, I got a bus then to Vang Vieng, uh, which is, I don't think the town would exist apart from backpackers travelling around Southeast Asia. The town would not exist. It's solely there because of its amazing karst scenery with the huge rocks and the island or the, the river down between and it we the thing you do in, in Vang Vieng is you go tubing. So you get this big rubber tube, r black rubber tube, you hire it for the day and they drop the you get a tuk tuk and you get dropped at the first pub and you stay at the bar and they get you very, very drunk. Which seems super safe, don't you think? Uh, they get you really drunk until about like three o'clock, and then you all go on the river, drunk. <laughs> now there used to be like ten to twelve bars all the way down along this river course, and it takes probably about two or three hours to float down it. So a lot of people would start like at ten o'clock in the morning, get really really drunk, and then just off. They'd pull you in. They they fling out ropes into the river and like pull you in, and you were all like everyone kind of tends to like grab onto another tube to kind of not be floating on your own. It was so much fun, but I didn't do much drinking because death, <laughs> because of death. So I wasn't very drunk. I had like one or two beers and that was it. I, was, I don't know. I'm, I think I'm a very reasonable traveler and I think I've worked in a hospital for far too long to go in for that sort of thing. Also, I have knitting to keep me happy. I don't need drugs or alcohol. I've got knitting. <laughs> These are the squishiest, nicest socks. Blueberry waffle. Blueberry waffle. Right, carry on. I've talked about them too much. Can you ever talk about them too much? Oh, so pretty. Pretty, 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 pretty. Stop it. Stop it. Now. Where was I? Oh yes, so um, Vang Vieng. Uh, so we went down tubing and I must have caught something and everybody gets sick in Vang Vieng. Everybody, I got the flu. It was so, so bad. Like, I normally just push on through sickness because I have to, you know, just carry on. And I was traveling and I couldn't exactly just stay at a place for ages because I'd got flights booked and I needed to get places. So. Feng Feng was quite a good place to get sick because they have bars where you can literally lie down on the seats and watch Friends all day. All of the bars play Friends 24-7, like, not 24-7, because they were only open until 12. But it was a fairly good place to be sick. And then I got a bus. No, a bus in Lao. I thought that the bus from Huai Zai to Luang Prabang was, good, was a little bit like provincial because we were going through the mountains and a little bit of country road. Turns out that's the main road and it's like that all the way to the capital. There's no paving, there's, there is, there, there was at one stage tarmac on the, on the roads. Um, nobody's gone back over it in 50,000 years. And the whole place is just mainly potholes. So it was like you're on the bus and it's like... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I was so sick as well. Oh, it was really, really bad. Um, so I got into uh, um, Vientiane, which is the capital of Laos. And the only bit of paved road in the entire country seems to be from the airport into Vientiane, <laughs> which I was so grateful for. So I got a tuk-tuk then, the dustiest tuk-tuk in the land. I had to like wrap something around my head. I was like, Oh my god, I totally understood, you know, that um, the Asian thing where they have the masks on their faces all the time. Totally get it. Totally get it. You need one. They were selling them like special ones. You can have like one that looks like a, a little kitten face or a dog face. It's so cute. I didn't get one of those. I just wrapped a scarf around. And um, I just basically died in in the hostel in Vien Vien, and, or Ventien because 
Oh, they had such lovely mattresses in that place. It was called Mixay Hostel. Oh, stay there if you ever need to. So lovely. They were carrying my bags over there. Like, you're, not, you're not very well. I'm like, no, I'm not. Oh. And I basically just lay on the couch until my flight at five o'clock and they just got me a taxi. Anyway, got into Hanoi. I was flying into Vietnam. My first introduction to Vietnam. And I was feeling a little bit better. And I stayed in a hostel, or a hotel, a room to myself. My first room to myself. And so, actually, possibly since I left, since I'd left Ireland. <gasps> oh no. No, my boyfriend did buy me a nice room in Heathrow when I was waiting to fly out to Singapore. Thank you, boyfriend. Um... So I was just loving it in Hanoi and I, I discovered that I met a friend who was actually my camera woman in the Elephant Nature Park in Chiang Mai, Chiang Mai, Chiang Mai. And she was in Hanoi at the same time. She was like, oh my gosh, we should do Heilong Bay together. I was like, yes. So we booked Heilong Bay and um, it was gorgeous. It was so, so nice. Went out and got the bus to it and it was, we paid quite a lot of money, probably too much for what, you know other people apparently paid but we got to see so much we went out on the junk ship and everybody the, the staff were super nice and we did karaoke that night it was funny we went to see this beautiful cave this natural cave because the whole thing is in limestone so limestone eats away that's the, the whole prospect of limestone it eats away at the inside and it's just like these gigantic caves and they always like to find animals in the rocks because it's very kind of an animalistic kind of culture sort of and um there's all of the uh, all of the islands around Heilong Bay are also given names like Frog Island or Dog Island because apparently they look like animals to the fishermen. They did, and a lot of a lot of the islands are unnamed because there's just too many. So the fishermen know exactly where they are, but I totally get lost. And we went to a pearl farm, which was fascinating. It takes, it's kind of barbaric how you actually get pearls, like real pearls from Vietnam. Because what they do is they they get the pearls, they get the, the clams and when they're about two years old they open them and they cut out one of the membranes around the side which is actually what starts the pearl making. So they have that and they insert it, they basically do a surgical procedure on the living, the rest of the living clams and they insert a tiny tiny bit into the the ovary or the gonad, basically the reproductive centre of the clam. And then they just leave it. They hang it and basically they leave it for years. It takes up to 10 years to create a pearl. And there's three different types of pearls. There's like the, the pink pearl and then there's the black pearl and then there's another one. It's like a, like a turquoisey there's like a white one and then a turquoisey pinky one and then a black pearl. And they each take different amount of time. And 50% of the clams fail. They don't produce any pearls. Uh, another 25% of them produce substandard ones or misshapen ones. Um, and then I think it's the 10%, 10 to 15% of them die from the procedure and then it's only down to like something like five or ten percent that actually produce sellable pearls saleable pearls which is why they're so expensive and it kind of it kind of put me off pearls you know it's a bit barbaric it's not like because they're farmed you know I've kind of recently turned vegetarian including seafood from all of my travelling actually it's turned into just an eye-opening experience anyway, I, I first started turning a bit vegetarian because I was so sick in coming into Vietnam and I think it was just the smell of the Vietnamese food it just just thinking about it now actually I'm sure it was just because I was sick and it's that that memory has just stayed with me now but especially around Hanoi there was like dogs being you know spit roasted and you could like fry up your own food but you didn't know what sort of meat you were getting and it's just 
just not, not, not for me, not for me. I was just like, no, no, actually, I think I'll try to stay away from the meat for now. Um, and it was, it was okay to go around and try and find vegetarian food, but I did, I did find myself hungry. I did miss meat, you know, but anyway, that's another adventure that we're going down. Um, so Hei Long Bay was absolutely stunning. So the, per the, the pearl farm was fascinating, very interesting, really intriguing. And yeah, I'm not going to buy any more pearls. <laughs> not okay with it. Um, what else do we do? So came back around. Oh, we went swimming and kayaking in Heilong Bay as well. And uh, it was very cold. And it probably wasn't the best thing for me to do when I was sick. But I didn't get more sick. So you have to say you've gone swimming in Heilong Bay. So I just jumped in, swam around, got on the kayak and got back out again. So that was, it was really, really good. Um, so when we got back to um, Hanoi, which is like about two or three hours away from Heilong Bay, um, I was wandering around and I looked up online and I was like, knitting shops, Hanoi, Hanoi's a big city. Yeah, I'll find some yarn. Turns out they have a whole street full, a whole street of yarn. <sighs> and it was the first place I looked around and I was like, hang on, she's knitting in the corner of that shop over there. She's knitting. <gasps> that lady in the stall, she's knitting. <gasps> So, so yeah, first place I saw people knitting again, I was like, yes, because it is cold in Hanoi, and I didn't realise it's best time to visit is in the summer, or at least, you know, I've got my little teapot, um, or at least in spring, not in winter, when I went, <laughs> silly, silly lady. Um, so I bought, um, now, it was mostly, mostly acrylic again, um, and most of it was from China or uh, Korea. Now, I don't know which one this was from, but this, does anybody read Read it? <laughs> so cute, look, baby sheep. It was the um, the kind of nicest colorway I wanted, I could find, uh, but I liked, and also it felt really nice. Does anybody read that? Do you read that? What is this? Probably just where it is and where it's from. But it's made of, Something, something, and something. 70% something, 10% something, 10% something, and 50% 50 grams. Yeah, so I got two, two balls. Um, I think it says cashmere silk protein. And it does feel super soft. So I'm hoping that it actually is cashmere silk protein. Probably not for the price I paid. So I've scanned the rest of, I've actually knit these up into something and I've skinned the rest of them into minis <laughs> just because everyone's going on about minis and I love them oh they're so nice to hold they're like oh, cuddly 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 so these are the colours now it's very bright there it's not actually the colour hang on like, there you go so it's like a really light blue and a neon like a pale neon green very pretty very pretty and these are my Hermione's everyday socks and I knit them two at a time again on um on two uh, with sorry I knit them two at a time again with a heel flap and gusset I'm doing it anyway Kay but they're so beautiful and I gave these to uh, my brother's girlfriend and um, so these are Vicky's now and I robbed them out of her sock drawer sorry Vicky I had to show people but um, these are actually knit when I was in Myanmar in Burma they're so pretty look I thought at the start that you couldn't see the pattern at all the variegated yarn was like ruining it and <laughs> there's my laddering again because I didn't realise you have to put on the second stitch not the first stitch when you start around on magic loop so so I started off with I think it was only a small amount uh like quite a small amount because I think I have quite a loose gauge for at the moment so I started these on or I thought I did anyway that's another story I'll tell you about um so this is two by two twisted rib and this is a mistake where I did just did two pearls I think this is at the other side of the 
yeah, it's just at the other side of the magic loop thing. Oh well. I think I started off at only 50 stitches. Because I was finding that it's really, like, they're really baggy around the top and they were just falling down. So I started with 50 and then I just increased down. You can see I'm in, as I increased down here. So I increased out to the ankle. And then heel flap and gusset, which is perfect. And I possibly did a mistake there. Is that a mistake? Yeah. Yeah, that's a mistake. That's okay. <laughs> It's fine. They're beautiful. Oh, I love these. They're so, so nice. So Vicky's one like I did the same on both sides, though. I, I, I seem to have, like, just stopped the pattern there. I think it just must have increased in. I don't know. Or decreased in. I did the same on this side. I don't think that's... I don't think that's too bad. Okay, so I picked up the stitches a bit wrong here. Or I decreased wrong here, and that's okay. So I did it. I did them both wrong the same. So that's what matters. I made my own pattern. I forged my own way. <laughs> but they're so beautiful. So it worked up really, really nicely, and the wool was so soft to knit with. It was beautiful. It was the first, um, the first wool that was so soft and so nice. And I washed them in conditioner bath when I was in. Yeah, when I was here in Perth, I finished them in Perth. Oh, I just love the way it picks up and then just like, looks so professional. Anyway. So it was minus two at a time pattern and then I borrowed the, um, the tutorial from Kay of the Bakery Bears uh, in her uh, patron's tut tutorials, which are awesome. Um, where was I? Right, yes. So I have here Hanoi 666. Yes, Hanoi 6. People knitting, Heilong Bay. Whole street of knitting. Oh, yes, uh, there's a lot of rats. Rat watch. I was on rat watch. I got up to seven one day. That was nice. Uh, and the scooters. And I was I was prepared for the amount of scooters and the busy roads. That was fine. That didn't bother me. Um, so that's fine. So I flew down to Hoi An then, which is a beautiful colonial town. Um, and they are famous for clothes making, so for tailories, tailors, and everybody seems to go there to get their stuff made. I didn't really fancy anything. Um, I didn't want to spend too much money um, on clothes. Um, kind of wish I did after I saw some of the stuff that was made. It's so beautiful. Uh, it turns out I was stuck there for um, se se seven days. Because uh, I arrived during Tet, which is Lunar New Year, where everything closes down and everything is four times as expensive to get anywhere. And I didn't want to hire a scooter because I didn't want to die. Uh, I've spoken about that before. I, I'm just terrified. Of, I've just heard so many terrifying stories of people coming off and insurance companies not paying for them to come home or even get better because they didn't have a proper scooter license. But anybody is able to rent one in Southeast Asia. So I was just like, no. So we, I met a group of lovely, lovely people and um, we just hung out in Hoi An for, for like a week, uh, just doing nothing really. I stayed in this homestay with this lady and it turned out that I ended up minding the homestay a couple of days because she had to go and spend time with her family for Chinese New Year. And I was like, I'm doing nothing. Yeah, work away. And um, yeah, it was great. I met some, I met lovely Kim and oh gosh, what's the other guy's name? Jay! Oh! Jay! How could I forget you? Oh, it was so nice. <laughs> they were just so lovely and we saw we saw the fireworks together and it was wonderful. It was very wonderful. And a girl that I met in um in in uh Hanoi as well. I actually told her about my homestay and we all stayed there together. So it was like a family. It was like our group. It was really funny because on Lunar New Year, when we came back from the, the fireworks, it, she was very, very careful. She was very specific. She was like, what you're reborn, what you're reborn, what, what you're reborn. The woman who owned the homestay. We were like, oh, okay, this year, this. She's like, okay, you are the, I am the ear of the rabbit, and I'm allowed to come into the house first. It's very important that um, 
someone with a lucky or good fortune sign enters the house first because it brings in luck for the new year and the other two were like snakes <laughs> so I got to come in first and I was really like scared I was like oh god and they wanted to stay out drinking and I I can't stay out past 12 I'm like mm, tired so I like walked home myself and um I was like I was really concerned I like I was like I have to get in I have to bring her luck for the new year so <laughs> I did that all right um, so that was nice um, and then I flew down to Ho Chi Minh because flying was the only way you could get around during Tet because it was actually cheaper than everything else and faster and I was really upset because I didn't get to do Hue, I didn't get to do Hue and I didn't get to do Da Nang I didn't get to do Da Lat I didn't get to do any sort of beach but I was like I'm going to have loads of beaches in Australia I'll be fine um, so I really feel like I didn't get the best out of Vietnam when I was there just because I went during Tet and I wasn't spending time with the family or we made our own family but it's not quite the same um, so yeah went to, went to Ho Chi Minh and I booked a tour to the, the Kuchi tunnels which were fascinating oh it was so interesting um, so the Kuchi tunnels Kuchi uh, is a region outside of um, Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City, um, up to the north, and it was one of the most bombed um, areas during the war. And they that's where they used Agent Orange to defoliate the trees, and uh, there's some horrific, horrific consequences because of that. Um, I went to the War Remnants Museum and I saw so much about that, it was fascinating. Um, sorry, saying um all the time. Oh well, I can't help it. So these tunnels. Oh God, they're, apparently there's over 250 kilometers of, I think, uh, that you can access about 200 kilometers of them still. 50 of them are just, you can't get past them because they're bombed out. Um, it was really, really interesting hearing it from their point of view. Now, I know that there's always two points of view in a war, but it seems to me that, you know what, people should just let people be people. I think, personally, because a lot of things happened there and it was not okay. But, and gosh, those those Vietnamese, they did know how to cause damage to people. But only if you came into their land, you know. It's their land. But they had these horrific traps and everything that you would not want to, you would not want your worst enemy to fall into. They did, apparently. So they did. Oh, but they're so small, I could not imagine. Like, I know that I'm a tall Western person, but even, even like, a small Vietnamese person. Like, they had everything down there. They had, like, they had kitchens that had, like, smoke, like, defoliators. So they had, like, chimneys that spread out so that the smoke came up really slowly and they only cooked at night time when the mist came in. And the fires were like all underground. They had hospitals under there. They had like barracks. They had storerooms. They had everything. It was so impressive. Um, it was amazing. So we went to, they always had a gun range, which they were like, look how many guns we had. We are robbed from the Americans. I mean, like they took from the Americans when they killed them. It's like, look, we still have them. And I'm like, awesome. Do you, do you think you maybe learn from what's happened and maybe guns are not a good thing? I don't know. But it was a shooting range, so they weren't shooting people. So that's good. People are, you know, animals. So that's good. So um, and then the War Remnants Museum was really, really, really interesting. It was fascinating. The pictures that were taken were absolutely stunning. And there was a whole space dedicated to all the war photographers um, which who died in the war and it was like this is the last photo that he took before the war and it was like the you know the exactly where the mine was that he stepped on it's all a bit gross and there was a big dedication to the victims of Agent Orange which is a genetic um, which has genetic repercussions down the line and ends up in um, severely deformed children in I think there's still people are still being born today that are genetically affected it's just not pleasant um, but they had this amazing shop in the, I love a little shop in a museum do you? I love a little shop oh I love a little shop um, I think um, 
David Tennant, Doctor Who, David Tennant, the Doctor Who years of David Tennant, um, he's like, I can't believe they don't have a hospital without a little shop. Love a little shop. I'm like, my motto in life, love a little shop. But they had, like, this kind of pop referency type um, posters and books and stuff. And there was this. And I love it. So this is in my little notions bag. And I just keep like little notes in here about like areas and places of yarn I bought in different places and what's that? Oh just ideas for the podcast and just different little little comments. Be happy where you are. Bakery bears things. Oh I wrote a little um I wrote a little um I wrote a little article for the Bakery Bears News about my travels. And so it's just a little, oh, it's so cute. I bought two and I'm using the brown paper one and I think I might give the other one to my boyfriend. It's a white one. Oh, that was supposed to be a secret. He'll watch this. Ah, oh, surprise. Anyway. <laughs> so what else did I buy in Vietnam? So in Hanoi, uh, or in Ho Chi Minh City, sorry, in Ho Chi Minh City, which is down the, down the bottom. Um, after I came out of the War Remnants Museum, I was walking back because the taxi was too expensive. Uh, I was walking back, and I like walking, and it was fine. Um, I crossed a road, and I had a crossbody on, and uh, a scooter came past, turned down, grabbed my bag, and tore me to the ground. Um, I held onto the bag, and he didn't get anything. The bag broke. I had everything else in my bag. Nothing was taken, apart from myself, uh, my my sense of safety so I was terrified <laughs> completely terrified and I was really pissed off really really angry furious that it's well known that that happens so always wear a crossbody whenever you're traveling in Vietnam um, because they do it all the time all the time and people say oh anything bad things can happen in any city and I'm like oh, like no Vietnam is notorious notorious for it uh, it's happened to four people that I know. So it's just in a specific way that it's done as well. You're crossing the street, you have a bag, they have a scooter and they grab it. It's like a gang or something. Now, don't tell me it happens in every city. I know it happens in every city, but it happens specifically in Ho Chi Minh City a lot. Uh, so I was sort of really annoyed uh, at the country. And I went back. On my way back, I passed a wool shop that I'd looked at before, and I got some sock yarn. Well, I think it's sock yarn. I think it might must be. Oh, hang on. Come back, come back. What's happened? Oh, 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 I'll just leave that there. I got two of them. So it's basically Red Heart, and it was like the first Red Heart I was able to get, because I've never been able to get American um, yarn before. Uh, and Ho Chi Minh is Saigon, which was owned by the Americans, so there's a lot of American influence there. It was the first place they had, like, McDonald's and Starbucks and... KFC and everything and um, so I got this and it's obviously pretty, pretty old but it's 73% 70, wool, 27% nylon, quite small like one super fine that's sock, that's sock weight surely it's denim jeans so I got this thinking I'd get this I'd make something for my boyfriend but I'd need in more than just this I think I could try, I could try give it a go, I was thinking of doing contrasting heels and toes um but I couldn't find any other colours. So, anyway, I got that on the way back, and then I was like, I'm not leaving my hotel room. <laughs> I was so scared. I was really, really anxious then, and I was just furious, and just like, no, I'm not going to give anything else to this country. It's taken my health, it's taken all the things I wanted to do because of Tet, and obviously that's just my timing and my illness, and... I got food poisoning as well at some stage, and it was... <laughs> I'm sorry, Vietnam, but you just didn't do... You didn't, didn't do it for me. So I'll have to go back in a couple of years and try again, maybe. We'll see, but... Anyway, um, so during my rehab, uh, I did a lot of rehab knitting, which got me back to myself, which was lovely. And I want to say thank you to a couple of people. To, who helped me through 
my rehab knitting. First person is Shannon of Socks Etc. Because that was when I was hiding in my little capsule room uh, in the in the dormitory. I just watched all of her episodes, and she just made me feel so much better about myself. She made me feel happy. Uh, I loved watching her. She made me laugh, and I needed that so much. So thank you so much, Shannon, for that. You know, you really every smile helped during that period it was really scary and also I started watching the grocery girls who were just hilarious and I think I woke up everything so I watched that quite late at night I woke up everybody because I was laughing so hard <laughs> I love you girls you're so good you're so so brilliant so thank you very much for helping me through that time and also I started watching Katie now I think I say Katie right but I might say Katie like with a like a slightly like an s instead of the T, which is the Irish way to say it, so Katie, uh, thank you so much for your beautiful, inspiring products. Oh my gosh. I think really you showed me exactly what I could do and I could do it differently to everybody else because you seem to have like a different aesthetic to a lot of the other podcasters that I watch. And I was like, oh yeah, I don't have to do exactly what they're doing. I can do whatever I want to do. So thank you so much, Katie. That's, it was just beautiful. So it's the Inside 23 uh, podcast. And she's this super cute pug. Uh, oh, roly. Cuddles. Cuddles. So, um, yeah, you're just so lovely and so happy. So thank you very much. All of these, those three people really, those four people, two in the grocery girls, um, you really helped me um, during my little bit of panic, panic. I nearly forgot about uh, the Legacy Knits podcast, Sue and Chelsea. They totally helped me as well. I just love these women. Oh, they're amazing. And I have photographic evidence that I did watch them during this time. Horrible, horrible, horrible time. Because I just didn't trust anybody then, you know? And everyone was like, you know, oh, are you out to rob me? Are you out to rob me? And I was just all in my head, of course. Um, and then, so... On the, on the second last day, anyway, I was like, right, come on, now you've spent five days, or you've spent, you've spent two solid days doing nothing, you've got to get out and do something, and just wander around, have some dinner, you know, somewhere. I actually, like, I hadn't even eaten much in, like, the two days that I was inside, like, I bought some crisps on the way home, and I'd just been eating those. So, it was really bad. Um... So I got out anyway, and I had really nice breakfast. I had like eggs Benedict, and it was beautiful. Met this. I I started talking to people again. Started talking to a couple of guys who were traveling around. I they were like lone travelers tend to talk to each other. <laughs> people in people in couples or people in groups don't really tend to talk to anybody else. You ever find that? Only you only find out this if you're a lone traveler. Fascinating. But I bought this, my second project bag. And it's like a recycled like food bag or something. It's got fish in it. Fishes. And it's got this really handy extra pocket where like I was keeping all of my notions and stuff. Which is brilliant. But I love that it's recycled plastic. Love it. Love, 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 love. I'm big into recycling. Actually I'm more into refusing than recycling. But you know, if you have to, this is the way to do it. So so lovely and it's waterproof as well bonus bonus points so yeah these are the things that i bought in vietnam and the and the wool the blue wool the kind of red heart soft yarny wool with which was the first actual wool that i knew what it was made of so exciting but um oh in my hermitage i started knitting a hat out of i was talking about this last week out of the yarn I bought in, um, out of the wool I bought in uh, Bangkok from the Big Knit Cafe. And it's so cute. Yeah, that purple is showing up a little bit nicer. It is. It's, it's brighter than that. It's very dark in there. And this is the hat that I, that I made. And it was actually a hat that Shannon and I were both knitting at the same time. Hers obviously turned out correct. See, this, to me, looked quite thick. Like, it looked like a DK, but then it stretches and turns into fine, which is awesome. So it's like, like, sport at least sport, and then it goes, 
So when you knit with it, that's the actual weight of it because you're pulling it tight. So my hat, which was supposed to fit me, fits a small child. <laughs> it could fit me. It, maybe it does. There's my first colour work. Oh, <laughs> so, so tight. So tight around my head. It's supposed to be slouchy. <laughs> But it's very pretty when it's not stretched to death and all of the colour work is going a bit wrong. Hey, fuzzy hair. So, <laughs> the decreases are terrible. This is my first hat I've ever knit. Decreases, terrible. Because I added like, I didn't just, if it doesn't fit, I'm like, I'll just add another thing. I'll just add another thing. And I don't think farther on into the pattern. And I'm like, I'll figure it out when I get there. Not very good. Also, I think I just forget where I am most of the time on the patterns, so I just keep knitting until I realise I've knit too many. Oh well. So it was my first colour work, which I think worked really, really well, actually, apart from this joining section, which, because I did it magic loop, I didn't have a small set. And it was so nice. The colour work went so fast. and It was so satisfying. I'm definitely doing that again. I might do it in a, like, a proper colour. Or, like, I might do this hat properly. But then I... The, I think the colour work section was supposed to stop about here and I just kept carrying on up like I did another couple just to layer it up because I think I didn't do enough of this bottom section. <laughs> so it's twisted rib in the bottom and then the colour work chart all the way up. First time reading charts. So proud of myself. Yay. So this is my little hat. And I was going to like give it to a child that I met along the way. But um, when I, but after Vietnam, I was going to Myanmar, Burma. And Burma has just been opened to tourism. And you get a little, a little book when you arrive in Burma. Well, you can. And it's called Do's and Don'ts of Burmese culture. And one of the main ones is do not give anything to the children. So I was like, but I want to. But I want to. Um, because then they become dependent on tourists and they try and just just hassle you all the time and they don't go to school and they don't want to become their own people because they realise, oh my God, tourists have money. Oh my God, I want money, you know. So if you ever travel um, to a country where the children are begging, do not give them anything. Please don't. Even if you want to, it's not very good for their economy, for the child. Um, just don't do it. Even food, don't do it. Someone gave them toothpaste, apparently, because they kept coming up and being like, toothpaste, toothpaste, do you have any toothpaste? I was like, no. You know, that's what they think that you are then. You're just something just to give them things. So, that's my little, but that's gonna be more. Next week, I'm gonna speak more about Myanmar. I have so much to say about Myanmar. I thought I didn't have too much to say about Laos Vietnam, but it turns out I did, because I'm at like 47 minutes here, and then I had another... It's going to be an hour long. Oh, my God! So I want to say thank you to two more people who mentioned me. Ah, Shannon. Shannon mentioned me. And she was so sweet. <laughs> Shannon, we were having a sleepover in um, Ho Chi Minh, and you were helping me get over my scary episode. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for your friendship uh, in the last couple of weeks. And it's meant so much to me. Thank you so much. You're oh, super awesome having you in my corner for any for everything. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And um, Barbara from Knitting I Love. <gasps> Barbara! We're neighbours. Well, we were when I lived in Limerick because she uh, lives like... Now, Ireland, it has four million people in it, and it has around the same um, area as England, and England has 50 million. So, neighbours is an optimistic term in which anyone living within like a 10 kilometre radius of you is considered your neighbour. So she's my neighbour and I didn't know, and I'm so annoyed. So hopefully I'll be back within the next two years and we get to meet up. It'll be awesome, Barbara. Oh, she's so lovely. She makes these amazing DPN cozy things. And I'm in her jar. I'm in her jar. I could win one. Oh my God. Yeah, pumped up. Yes. And even if I don't, it's just so, so nice to be in her jar. Mm, it's 
so lovely. Um, I, I, I feel like I can't really enter into any knit alongs and stuff because I don't really have a permanent address. I only have my brother's address here and I'm only going to be here for another month. So, and postage in Western Australia, which is where I am now, is really slow. So I just, I just don't feel comfortable like asking people to send me stuff, you know, or ordering stuff to Western Australia because it's just, it couldn't get lost. It could just not get here and I'd miss it and I'd be gone and be really sad because I want everything. So I'll just have to wait and get something when I do have a permanent address, when I settle down in 57,000 years. <sighs> never, never. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to Barbara. So cool, so cool, Barbara. You were so, so nice. And I love the stuff she makes as well. So pretty. And she made the Narita show. I really want to make it so bad. But I don't have... I do have a skein of fingering weight that's coming to me. It's Hedgehog Fibres. I bought it when I was in Bath from the... Oh, what's it called? I bought it in Bath from a shop. I'll I'll put it down the damper. But, um, oh my gosh. It was like a, um, a unique colorway. Oh, it's so pretty. <gasps> Maybe I can make the Narita Express out of that. Oh, I could do that, couldn't I? Does it take one skein, Marcia? Maybe two. It might take two skeins. I don't want to run out. Barbara, does it take two skeins? Or one skein? It took the second... It, uh, did, it did, didn't it? It took the second skein for the applied border. Maybe I could do a different about applied border, applied edging. I'd want to get it in hedgehog fibers though to match. I don't know. <gasps> anyway, um, yeah. So I better stop now because it's getting really long. Do I have anything else to say? So I've spoken about past Grace Adventures. I've spoken a bit at the start about current Grace Adventures. I went to Denmark. All right. Well, it's been lovely talking with you today and sharing a little pot of tea in my brother's The Green Dragon mug from Hobbitland. I don't know what it's actually called. I assume it's called Hobbitland in New Zealand when he went there. So it's now my podcast cup until I meet my boyfriend and we go travelling. And you join us on our travels if you would like. And I just want to say another really, really, really massive thank you to everybody that subscribed. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And um, so next week I'm going to talk about Myanmar. I have it in here somewhere. I have a plan. Guys, I have a plan. Oh yeah, this is Myanmar. So much to talk about. Have I covered everything? Those, 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 those. Yes, bye!